Welcome to our audience. It's great to have you with us. And I'm thrilled to have David Horrocks, the CEO of CRISP with us. David, welcome. Hi, Mark. Great to be here. Thanks. We're, we're thrilled to have you. Um, in fact, why don't we begin at the beginning? Just tell us a little bit about yourself and CRISP and uh, your role there. And then I'll ask you a whole bunch of questions. Sure. Well, my name is uh, David Horrocks. I am the, the CEO of CRISP. CRISP is a, a nonprofit state designated health information exchange, which serves the state of uh, Maryland. And I have been here for 12 years. And uh, over that time, we've begun to work in affiliation with uh, other states and their nonprofit HIEs. So we, we actually have an affiliation of five nonprofit HIEs that work together, sharing technology, sharing uh, best practices and um, innovations. Right. And the other five states are? Well, West Virginia, uh, District of Columbia. And then in the past uh, year, we've begun to work with Connecticut and Alaska. Right. And CRISP stands for? Uh, Chesapeake Regional Information System for our patients. Yeah. It's a long name. That's right. I, I knew it, but I didn't want to say it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and tell me just a little bit about, uh, David, tell us a little bit about the evolution of CRISP and how it got to where it's at. And then we'll talk about some of the things you're doing and some of the interoperability issues. Yeah, the, uh, the genesis of CRISP really dates to about 2006 when um, an entrepreneur here in uh, Baltimore, um, a man named John Erickson, who uh, built and operated these very large campus retirement communities was bothered that uh, residents of his communities would go back and forth to the hospital, come back to see the primary care providers in the community or into the skilled nursing facility. And he just was very disappointed with the, the lack of coordination that was happening. And uh, John pulled together uh, some of the healthcare leaders, uh, the hospital leaders in Maryland in 2006, like, can we work together to try and solve this mm -hmm. for seniors? And, uh, and they, they did begin to work together. And in uh, 2008, uh, that group began to work with the state of Maryland, broadening beyond seniors to uh, what could we do to create a health information exchange for all citizens? Exactly. Wonderful. And when you look at the landscape right now overall, how do you see the work that you and your colleagues are doing at CRISP that, as you mentioned, conti is, continues to expand geographically and where HIE is right now nationwide, what some of the largest um, uh, challenges and opportunities are now for health data exchange? Yeah, well, a lot is happening in the interoperability space, Mark. Uh, of course, not the least of which um, are the ways that organizations such as ours or these infrastructures have been used to support the COVID response the last exactly. two years. It continues to be uh, you know, top of the agenda uh, every week. All right, what are we working on this week? Well, there's still a lot that we're doing to support our uh, departments of health and uh, our Medicaid leaders and of course the delivery system as they manage through bed capacity and, and uh, immunization rates and, and boosters and, uh, and understanding just, just having situational awareness about disease progression. So uh, there's a lot that, that we are all doing there, but, but that's also in a backdrop of uh, uh, TEFCA and the info blocking rules coming into effect and and in our industry some uh, really some consolidation of uh, of those who do this this work either in the way that we've done uh, through affiliations among nonprofit HIEs or uh, some some straight mergers as is happening in in other places yeah and I definitely want to talk about Tefka before we do let's just train this a little bit broadly um, as you saw, we, we labeled the, uh, the headline for this session from connectivity to interoperability. Mm -hmm. uh, what, I'm just going to ask you at a 40,000 foot level, what, what might that phrase mean to you? What, do, what might that look like to you? Well, I, I, 
I, when I read that uh, phrase, I think just making the connections is not enough to have information that's usable and actually improves health and wellness, or there's a lot more that goes into it. And I think the technology is, is only a piece of it as well, Mark, it's policy, it's yeah. financial incentives and, uh, and other things that sort of fit together to, uh, to make the work effective. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit about TEFCA, the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement, uh, and its ongoing evolution. First of all, I'm sure you can do this much better than I can, but where are we right now in the development of TEFCA? Uh, I know we're waiting on the federal government. We're waiting on ONC for a few things, but where, where is TEFCA right now in its evolution? Well, the TEFCA of course has two parts, the sort of framework that under which uh, uh, exchange would happen or the TEF, Trusted Exchange Framework, and then uh, the legal agreement by which these things would happen or the, the CA common agreement part. Um, we have a designated organization to, um, to manage uh, TEFCA, the quote, recognized coordinating entity that is uh, the Sequoia Project. I'm actually on the board at the Sequoia Project. So yeah. uh, it's great to uh, work with them as they pursue this. They are actively um, engaged with stakeholder groups in refining the, the rules and, uh, um, and such that will make up uh, TEFCA. We are not yet at a point where uh, the exchange is happening under that framework today. Uh, I think we're also waiting to see, uh, I think a very important part of the, of the development of the framework is um, who will be the organizations that are directly participating in the so-called uh, uh, qualified entities. Right, and the few hints, right? Few hints, yes. Yeah. And, uh, we're trying to figure out what that will, will look like. Organiz in fact, organizations such as my own are trying to like, okay, are we, we're gonna have to go find a, a QHIN with whom we're gonna partner? Are we gonna become a QHIN ourselves? And so we're, we're all trying to figure that out. Right, yeah, it's, it still is a work in progress. I, do you believe, let me just ask one other specific thing about Tefka. Do you believe to, like on a scale of one to 10, <laughs> what, um, what number would you rank TEFCA as a potential game changer in this entire landscape? Is it going to be a 10 where it'll change everything, a zero where it'll change nothing? Is it going to be a four or five? What, what is your sense? Well, Mark, I think I'm going to give a, very, a highly caveated answer uh, to that. I, I think some of what we're trying to get done with TEFCA, having nationwide exchange is uh, is actually happening already with uh, you know e-health exchange some of the EHR vendors themselves have uh, yeah. frameworks that are that are proving successful uh, and in that sense I'm not sure you know we didn't necessarily need Tefka for a lot of good interoperability uh, to happen um, what I think Tefka could get us to though is, more ubiquitous interoperability happening yeah. or ubiquitous exchange. I, it, you know, when it's paired with what we all think is inevitably some uh, regulatory uh, pressure to participate or incentive mm -hmm. or something, I, I think that we could get to, uh, you know, closer to a universal participation in those, in those national networks. So in that sense, I think it could be very, uh, very important. Yeah. And I, from my understanding, and everyone seems to have a different understanding, <laughs> which is one of the challenges. It's, it's like the classic Indian fable of the six blind men and the elephant, you know, some have touched the tusk and some the trunk. My, from my, under, my personal understanding, if Q hens end up um, evolving forward the way that they've been framed to do so in the future, they could be game changers. I think there are a number of questions underlying that though, as to whether they will ultimately become the powerhouses that we might hope, right? Would you agree? I would. 
Yeah. Lot, there's still a fair bit of speculation. Yeah, absolutely. As to the, how the Q hens will evolve. Yeah. And the proof is in the proverbial pudding, right? <laughs> so what, what do you think the biggest challenges are to pervasive interoperability in the next few years? You know, I, I think that what we are, we're making great progress on uh, the technology standards and, and uh, you know, the frameworks under which interoperability um, happens. You know where we, we have not made progress though uh, as an industry is the way in which we engage patients. Yeah. And uh, we are not particularly effective at capturing patient consent for the thing, and I'm using a big, very collective we here, we're not great at capturing uh, patient consent or even a inf very informed consent and in how information gets used. And we're not particularly effective at delivering health information, uh, a patient, you know, their own health information. So I see that as a, if we're gonna have real ubiquitous interoperability, it really should be uh, engaging the patients more effectively than we do today. And I see that as the, the, the big remaining barrier. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Where are, uh, oh, I know, I was going to ask you, can you just share one or two nice advances that, that you've made at CRISP that you, that you're proud of that, that you think, uh, our audience should share about recent ones? Sure, a couple of things in the past year, uh, working with uh, the Department of Health in Maryland. First, we uh, began to create reports for primary care providers and then other care managers on immunization status. Uh, we call this a vaccine tracking service. Uh, we've been working with the Department of Health for a number of years and, and they have some other efforts to try and create uh, maybe bi-directional interoperability with EHR systems that are good for understanding a single patient's situation, but they're not particularly effective for outreach. And uh, these reports will, for instance, let a, a, a practice say, okay, who uh, among my practice is late for a second shot? Or who that meets this criteria has diabetes and is of a certain age and has not received uh, a booster? And that really should facilitate outreach and, uh, and in fact, we see higher immunization rates uh, among the practices that have used that tool the most. So that's one. Great. Um, we are working with the Department of Health in uh, uh, District of Columbia to get uh, the lead registry information into the hands of primary care providers as well. That this information is being captured and, and uh, uh, when there are children who have had lead, lead exposures and how do we make sure that their PCPs uh, are aware of that? So that's the second thing that we're working on. I've mentioned from the past year. Yeah, wonderful. What, more broadly, what are the smartest HIE leaders doing? And I, I uh, definitely include you in that. Oh, but you. in any case, the smartest HIE leaders nationwide, what are they doing right right now in general? Um, there's much talk in the industry right now, Mark, about uh, HIEs turning into uh, public health data utilities and playing a role that's not just about moving records from one point of care to another point of care, but partnering closely with uh, healthcare leaders and especially public health leaders yeah. to uh, enhance data sets that are used for public health purposes, to be a, a force extender of sorts for, for public health agencies and, and to more effectively get information back from public health down to uh, out into the field, such as the lead registry uh, yeah. example. So uh, there are a handful of states that have been uh, really very effective in this. I think in Nebraska, um, Arizona, uh, Indiana is doing a lot, New York is doing a lot, and uh, Michigan. And, uh, and they're all serving in this role that, that I would call a, a utility-like role in the way that we are, are partnered with the state. Uh, my peers and I, I think, are actually very eager to see that, that model expand 
uh, to other parts of the country. There's so much value that I think can be created when you combine public health information with clinical information, mm -hmm. uh, and it can solve some of what were obvious shortcomings early in the pandemic in our in our information flows. Yeah. Do you do you think we learned a significant amount so far in the pandemic as HIEs like yours became inextric inextricably connected to public health? Uh, biosurveillance uh, processes? Well, we're, we're all certainly making progress. And uh, how much of that was learning versus, uh, I think the first thing that happened is there was a willingness to collaborate and cooperate across the system uh, that we accomplished in a matter of a few weeks, what might have taken years to, to get done. Yeah. Uh, without the pandemic. So um, I can say that in Maryland, the hospitals were very, very rapidly uh, sharing information that provided like real time uh, information on uh, bed capacity and availability of PPE equipment and respirators back then when we, we needed those things. Those things happened very rapidly. And, and I think, Mark, that uh, you know, some of that collaboration is, is going to persist and it's not permanent. That is a, a permanent feature of the system is that that kind of collaboration uh, will continue. Those information flows, that more transparency um, to the delivery system, I think is, is uh, permanently here, I hope. Yeah, I do too. I think that's great. Um, what do the next couple of years look like in the development of HIE from your perspective? Well, we're, I can tell you that in, uh, in the states where, where we are operating, we are doubling down on that partnership with public health and serving as that public health data utility. Uh, there's just so much additional opportunity to be um, effective there. And you think about processes that are broken in the, in the country. Uh, if, if you were a parent and uh, a child experiences an overdose and you'd like to get them services, that's, that can be really cumbersome today. And uh, information flows and partnerships across the system and, and I think can make those things better. And uh, so there's lots of work to do, I think partnered with, with public health. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And for that, my last question, what advice would you give to other healthcare leaders from across the industry? as they think about, if they're in a provider organization, as they think about collaborating on data exchange, as they think about where they go next in terms of what kinds of data they need and want to share. Yeah. Well, um, well, two thoughts. First, maybe I'll expand on your, your prior, and I talked about the public health engagement. Right. Another place that we're headed is another sort of data that is becoming important is social factor data, because everyone understands or is recognizing more clearly the importance of those social factors or social determinants of health. And uh, while we know those things to be true, um, we, we can't start to develop perhaps interventions to address some of those factors if you don't even have the information about those factors, if you don't have visibility into what's happening across the system. So, um, that is an area of emphasis for us right now, and I know for many others uh, as well. There's still quite a bit to figure out. So I emphasize um, engagement on social factors as an area uh, for future work. I think for advice, Mark, I'd say first, uh, just be willing to collaborate. This is not, um, I, I believe we're beyond largely uh, the place where organizations think that holding on to data is gonna be part of their competitive advantage. I, I, I don't get that sense the way that perhaps a decade ago um, I might have like resist that urge. That is, we, uh, there are other ways that we are going to uh, differentiate ourselves than just holding on to information. So be willing to collaborate, jump in um, and, and build these things. And I, 
I hope that other states, I hope that states like Florida that have cooperated on, I think on some narrow things very effectively, but there, there's opportunity to collaborate in, in broader ways. So I, I hope that those, those efforts are undertaken. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just want to thank you for your leadership and the leadership of CRISP in this industry, because what you and your colleagues are doing is really shining a light on the path forward, David. And uh, so thank you for your leadership. Well, thank you for saying so, Mark. And I, I believe that the, the public servants and, uh, and folks in, in our healthcare delivery system in, uh, in the state have been a very big reason that we've had the opportunity to do innovative things. Yeah, I, I mean, that speaks to, you know, every state has its own culture and its own public policy and le legislative culture. Sure. I will say that when I think about the states in which statewide HIE has flourished, including yours, they, those states do have a really good public policy culture. And there is some sense of commonwealth that, yeah. that right? That we need yeah. to do things I, together. I think where HIE has been most successful, it, it, there is a bit more of a utility mindset now. These are organizations which are statewide. Yeah. Uh, there is often some, some mandate for information sharing. There are uh, protections, extra protections for patient privacy in those organizations. They, they tend to be uh, nonprofits that are public-private partnerships. They're not quite inside of state government, but they're, they're not uh, uh, you know, commercial enterprises either. So I, yes. I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would just add that I think that going forward, the next few years could be pivotal depending on partly on how TEFCA plays out if it ends up being a really strong um, framework uh, and it is implemented excellently it could pu really push things forward I think yeah I hope so I hope you're right yeah. I hope the basic information, basic movement of medical records becomes highly commoditized and easy and uh, not something that gets in our way. And yeah. That's what we hope TEFCA will, will help us accomplish. Absolutely. Any final thoughts? Well, thanks for having me uh, today. And we're always, uh, for those who are working on this in, in other states, we're always open to phone calls and conversations to compare notes. Well, that's wonderful, David. Thank you. And again, I, the leadership that you've shown at CRISP and that CRISP has shown among fellow HIEs is so important. When I look at the landscape, uh, I think everyone would agree or concede that health data exchange is moving forward at different rates of speed in this country. And in some places, it's moving forward very quickly and well, and in other places that won't be named, <laughs> less so. But wherever it is moving forward, it is involving leadership, a personal leadership. That's how mm -hmm. things get done. So thank you again, uh, David Harks. This has been an, an excellent discussion. And I want to wish you and your colleagues at CRISP and all the states that you're operating in uh, the best uh, wishes. And I'm gonna wish our whole industry well as uh, Health Data Exchange moves forward going into the future. Thank you, Mark. Great, great to have you. This concludes the session and uh, thank you to you and our audience for participating.